Well, it it um, it's been written off, I suppose, to some extent as a curtain raiser for nineteen sixteen, but it was actually a different different world. I mean, nineteen the most important date in Irish history or European history is nineteen fourteen. It's not, certainly not nineteen sixteen or nineteen thirteen. But up until nineteen thirteen, there was the beginnings of um, discussion of what sort of future I, I, Irish state we should have because okay, it was home rule; it wasn't independence, but we would have had a, a parliament in College Green. The, the Labour Party, in the sense of these trade union representatives, would have had seat, would have won seats in that parliament in Dublin. Uh, it was an overwhelmingly peasant society, Ireland, uh, and very reactionary. But uh, in in Belfast and in Dublin and in Cork, you had the beginnings of debates about urban issues like like children. You know, who control? Is, does the church uh, control child education? Do the parents have control of the children? Issues like that were raised by 1913. Uh, globalization was an issue because uh, there was a race to the bottom taking place. Murphy wanted to drive down pay rates. It suited British employers to support him in his battle here because if he could beat smash the unions in in Dublin, it would help them fight unions in Britain and vice versa. With the unions supporting the Irish workers, the Dublin workers, so there was a debate taking place on social and economic issues rather than on national issues. Or you know, religion did intrude in a very bad way. Um, but there was the beginning of a sort of debate on, on a modern, secular, or urban, at least, society in 1913. Along comes the First World War, and that all changes. So the interesting thing, if you look at Bloody Sunday, um, Bloody Sunday became an iconic movement because it suited everybody. It suited the employers because who was doing the beating? It was the police, and who did the police work for? They worked for Dublin Castle. So the employers can sort of tiptoe off the stage and you know say nothing to do with us. Uh, it suits the nationalists because, again, the agents of oppression are the British government. Uh, it suits the trade unions as well because, you know, they have the more high ground and they did their best and they were hammered into the ground. So we needed an independent state. Uh, so everybody had to get something out of 1913. But it, it in a way, it's, um, it castrates it because uh, it takes all the, the teeth, it takes all the, all the, you know, the substance out of it. And it from becoming a really important battle about ownership of wealth and society and society and control of society it becomes just a, a curtain raiser for 1916 and the independence movement and the fact that the Irish Citizen Army on the Connolly moved towards a nationalist position I mean Connolly's position I think is is very revealing there because when he took over the Union Larkin went to America on a fundraising tour and a bit of a convalescing to recover from the lockout um, and he was trapped. He stayed there. It was partly by choice, partly by necessity. He, he didn't get back for 10 years, so he missed the entire decade that followed. Connolly uh, took over as acting general secretary. But Connolly's real interest, it became clear very early on, was the Citizen Army. It wasn't the Union. Uh, and I think one of the reasons for the Union's decline was he'd spent all his time uh, with the Citizen Army. Then he became one of the leaders of 1916 Rising. That was very important in the sense that it helped legitimise the labour dimension or socialist dimension to the national struggle. Um, but on the other hand, it was very definitely a case of playing second fiddle to the nationalist movement. So there were pluses and minuses. Um, but because of that, um, you know, that whole change of direction, the same thing was happening all over Europe. I mean, national nationalism. Uh, I mean, people remember the Russian Revolution uh, because it was the most significant event to come out of the First World War. But the fact is that all over Europe, including Russia, there were very strong nationalist movements. And these countries broke free from the old imperial prisons of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Turks and so on. Uh, that, that did happen, but it was an, a nationalist agenda. So 1913, uh, it was hijacked. I think what we're trying to do, what hopefully we're doing now is try and... Re retrieve it or reclaim it from from that sort of uh, national pantheon of her heroic failure and try and make uh, 1913 important again in its own lights and hopefully in doing that influence other centenaries that come up uh, like uh, 1916. So that's basically what we're uh, trying to do in the 1913 committee.